Welcome back to Linux Weekly, Daily Wednesdays, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vin, that's Jill. Just talking hello, in pre-show, hello. having fun watching our um, chat <laughs> relay bot have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It wasn't feeling it. It's the uh, bot that uh, Strider and Empty created years and years and years ago before it was even a thing that relays our chat from Twitch chat to our super secret Discord's live chat to IRC, and it tried and whew, it kind of exploded. It was fascinating. You had to be there. All right, let's go ahead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hop into it. You might notice after three weeks, uh, no, four weeks, if you look back, a familiar green block is lit up again. Yay. Which is my 828 MK3, which I ordered in t- an entire set. No, I, I didn't even bother to check it. I just put it back together, screwed <laughs> it together, and I'm like, guarantee you every single other one of those caps is just fine on the power supply. Plugged it in there, and now it works. Anyway, I have an entire recap kit just in case now. Very good, Ben. <laughs> good times. Learn to solder, kids. It'll save you a lot of money. Another thing yeah. I picked up. A regular, ordinary, completely normal, run-of-the-mill, everyday sound card. <laughs> yep. It looks just like a sound blaster, doesn't it, Joe? <laughs> ASI 5211. Audio science. Um, yeah. uh, no, that's not a headphone jack, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not a headphone jack. That is a balanced mic input, because it's got a preamp built into it. Along with a digitally yes, in and out, uh, analog edit out. It's got, you see the DSP with the Texas instruments. You're like, oh yeah, no, it's got equalizer, compenders, all this stuff built into it. As uh, over on the forums on interfacing Linux, I think Aaron chimed in with the uh, very classic, uh, didn't expect to see a heatsink on an audio card. So if you want to go <laughs> see what this thing looks like, um, what do you think about our uh, summer of full speed, Jill? Oh, yeah. It- it's a lot of fun. I love the the maps you chose, Ben, because you really do have to be full speed on those maps, and you got to kind of go through each segment and memorize the puzzle, you know, to each turn and and to each each goal you have to get through. It's the ultimate puzzle three D platformer, <laughs> Trackmania Stadium Two. <laughs> it's it's pretty pretty wild. Now, what Jill's yeah. talking about? We're filthy casuals. We've been doing this for a while, and uh, to celebrate. The summer of 2024, a super hot summer. We're going back in time, and uh, we started 2008. This week, we're in 2013, going back through classic tracks of just chaos. This is a it's a racing game, but it's also a puzzle platformer. If you want to look into it, uh, we have our own private server. If you're a Twitch sub or if you're a patron, link that up to our Discord. Get the launch codes. This thing runs on everything. And if you're getting up in age like me and Jill, it's important. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. To work on that hand-eye yeah. coordination. And this <laughs> does that, and we got a great supportive community. If you want to get on the audio call with us, we do it, and we stream it live on Tuesdays, and we do, we play chess on Fridays. It's definitely not a racing game on Fridays. It is a thinking person's game on Fridays, because it's all about collecting points, which means you just need more points to win than everybody else, and you do that by finishing them up. And you got yahoos like me, Turbo, and Ogi. Mm-hmm. And Alan, we're just trying to sling around the track something like we can't help ourselves. So, uh, and Gametron's got a great strategy of like, I'm just going to get through this. Yeah, yeah. And That's... <laughs> start stacking points up while we're flying off the track trying to race each other. So it's an interesting dynamic. And on Tuesdays, we put in new tracks. We're going to be doing all full yeah. speed all summer long. Come and join us. Love to see you there. Of course, it's a Linux server running on Linux, and the game runs fine under Proton, and it runs on a calculator. Like, it'll run on Intel integrated graphics. No problem, because it's ancient. And it's usually cheap. You know, it's like $9 full price, but it's always on sale. Go check it out. We'd love to hang out with you. But, Joe, Mm. (laughs) our dream... Some big news. (laughs) ...might finally come true. Yes. Maybe. Possibly. Tuxedo (laughs) is growing some arms. Yes, it (sighs) is. (laughs) <laughs> I'm really excited about this. Uh, Jill is too. Tuxedo <laughs> laptop with the Snapdragon X Elite SOC has been spotted in the wild at Computex. And, you know, you saw a couple of outlets uh, covering that's, for me at least, very exciting news because Tuxedo has uh, done the thing that we were waiting on. We're like, oh, yes. we, you know, we're like, oh, can <laughs> we just get a laptop and maybe put some Linux on it? They're going to try to cut out some of those extra steps there because, um, 
a German PC manufacturer, um, Schenker, they they're going to release one of these, and uh, Tuxedo is going to be working with them to release, you know, a hey, this thing's got Linux, everything's going to work on it, just buy it from us type deal, you know, something like, um, you know, System76 with their laptops, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very much a prototype right now. And by prototype, all the pictures that you may have seen of this, uh, outside of like one, I think, uh, it's, it's not powered up. It's not really doing anything. And that, that's because at Computex, it was stuck in a boot loop. So very yeah. <laughs> much prototype. And this is prototype one. Tuxedo's like, we're already moved on to prototype number two, which is good. Why does this get fascinating, yeah. though? If you don't know about the Snapdragon X Elite, it's a 12-core SoC, 32 gigs of RAM. It's what's going to be in the um, new Microsoft-led Surface Data Hoovering Device 9000s with all of its fancy stuff. It's here to trade blows. Even on Windows, DaVinci Resolve, the software I use to edit this show, they've released a version of ARM for this uh, application for ARM Windows. Like, times might be changing. Times might be changing. Um, yeah, 32 gigs. Are, and this is going to be their top of the line one here. 2560, 1600 uh, display, M.2 upgradable storage, and USB 4.0 holes to be found on it. Mm -hmm. No pricing and information. These laptops are probably, these are going to be high-end laptops or just across the board, Linux or no Linux. You know, you're going to be looking at like low-end 999, probably like 12, 1400 bucks for that, which unfortunately, <laughs> you know, if you're old like me, you're like, that's a lot of money for a laptop, but that's kind of the going price for a reasonable laptop these days, you know, unless is, your yeah. idea of a reasonable laptop's like <laughs> those uh, $300 S-boxes that you get at Walmart and you're like, hey, <laughs> it didn't explode and catch on fire. Winning. Looking forward to this oh. show. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> As Ben can see, I actually wrote a lot in the show notes because I was <laughs> so excited about this. So actually, uh, a little story. So last Wednesday after LWW, when I was reading more online posts covering Computex 2024, I found the pictures of the prototype Tuxedo Linux Snapdragon X Elite laptop being shown off at the German PC OEM Schenker tuxi slash Tuxedo booth. And I was just very excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's here sooner than we thought. And so it, what is cool, so four weeks ago on LWW 423, we had talked about Linux kernel 6.9 being released. And then it had better support for ARM processors, including ARM64 Rust code support. And, you know, one of the reasons for this is that Linus Torvalds now has a much more powerful ARM64 machine to compile the Linux kernel on. And also in that same episode of LWW, we talked about Qualcomm upping their support of the latest Snapdragon X Elite processor on Linux, and that Linux's new ARM64 computer has, you know, a lot to do with Qualcomm upping that support <laughs> for sure for sure and now we have the awesome news about the tuxedo computers linux snapdragon x elite laptop possibly coming out by the end of the year this is because full support by qualcomm of the snapdragon x elite soc is expected in the next months in the linux kernel 6.11 and uh so that's supposed to be when we get full support and 6.10 is supposed to have lots of improvements as well. So lots of excitement. We, we finally got our ARM processors coming, and they'll be better than some of Apple's. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is who Intel's worried about. Intel's not worried about AMD right now. Intel's looking at this. Why, why, are you not, why is Intel not worried about AMD? AMD's never been a threat on laptop. Why? AMD can't turn out the chips quick enough they don't have their own fabs they, they can't put out the quantity you know when dell and hp they come knocking they need millions they need millions amd just can't deliver those numbers um qualcomm can yeah they have experience and intel's like uh oh this could be a problem and that's absolutely a good thing you know i forget if it was um gamers nexus one of the tech tubers who were in taipei mm -hmm. they were talking to qualcomm a little behind the scenes and they said how many PCI Express lanes does this thing have? And they're like, I don't know. They're like, uh, any of them not used? And they're like, yeah, we got eight that are unused. <laughs> and they're like, what for? And they're like, 
Yeah, we can't say. No, ah, they're, they're, yeah. they're just there. Which I, I touched on this um, on Saturday on Linux Gamecast. I was like, all right, that, I think it's PCI Express 4.0. That's eight lanes. Having a desktop board is not outside of the realm of possibility here. Yeah. Then all of a sudden you, you get a buy eight PCI Express slot. You're good to go. We drop GP. What, what about AMD stuff's going to run? What about it? NVIDIA's already got ARM drivers. Had them for a long time. Now, let's go ahead and talk about Mozilla Firefox 127 has learned some new tricks. Sure has been. <laughs> so Mozilla Firefox 127 has been released and it includes some really cool new features for our favorite open source web browser. One of the cool new features is in the list, all tabs, tab bar widget, there is a new close duplicate tabs option, which enables you to close all your duplicate tabs in one click, which is really, really convenient. That's I treating the symptom, not the problem. Quit oh. using your tabs as a bookmark. Yeah, so I'm guilty of this. I am, you know, appreciative of this feature because when doing research for LWW show notes, I seem to always have at least two to two or four duplicate tabs of news stories that I am currently reading open. And a lot of that is just, I just double click them on, on accident or cl click them on uh, from various links. And that, that'll be nice to clean up the tabs. <laughs> And Firefox 127 also improves the web page screenshot tool, which includes the ability to take screenshots of certain file types like XML and SVG and lets you take screenshots of some internal colon about pages. And the built in Firefox web page screenshot tool also includes new keyboard shortcuts and high contrast mode support for greater accessibility. That is awesome. <laughs> that, that is really awesome. My, my only other recommendation here is maybe when you move the mouse down to the, the um, when you were using the screenshot tool and you move, move the mouse over it, that it becomes a little bigger so those with visual impairment can see it better. <laughs> so, but this, this is really great for accessibility. So there's actually been a lot of major changes in this in this release. <laughs> and it just kind of snuck out there yesterday. <laughs> and I was they reading it. it this like, is oh what we want to see. This is all yeah. we want to see. I think when we think about Mozilla, you, you think about Firefox. What is uh, Mozilla not been focusing on in the past? Yeah, the years? web browser experience. Right. And now we're getting that. <laughs> like, let's just get back to doing this. Yeah. Stick with what brought you. So this is good to see. Good updates and um, yeah, good times all around. If you haven't played with Firefox in a long time, if you were like me, you know, I, I try to use Firefox, um, but I use a mix of everything. I use Chromium based. Like I'm not yeah attached to a particular browser, and uh, yeah, Firefox is perfectly serviceable. And mm -hmm. unless you're on Android, <laughs> I've I, gotten used to Firefox and Android. <laughs> uh, I don't get used to slow and clunky. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, it's 2024, I'll put up with that. Yeah. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on is to something that I want to bring back up, mainly because I got a 1.0 release. And I, I definitely think a lot of you have probably had this thought. If you ever think about user interface, user design, you know, how you interact with your desktop. Maybe you were like me. I remember like being a teenager, but like back in the 90s, going, how come we don't have like, circle menu you know yeah. something that like explodes and you do that i was like hmm that that would be kind of fun and like if you've been looking like maybe for a cross-platform pie menu like that for your desktop there's been options in the past like mm -hmm. people have taken stabs at this idea but we've never really seen it work out you know because you know you click on an area you get a little mini circle then you get a little line maybe another mini circle and you're like <laughs> Well, it's kind of like a little mini menu dungeon crawl when you think about it. And it is. Yeah, yes. it, it is an adventure <laughs> game, which, you know, even back in the night, it's like I, I get even given that a think. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make, I mean, it would be cool, but it doesn't make a lot of sense because you're thinking about using your mouse and you're like, click, 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 click. Then you look at something like, you know, CDE menu or the start menu, introduce in Windows 95, click, click, click. I'm like, right. It's not as fun, but it's a lot more efficient. However, if we fast forward to 
2024. Everything's got touch screens now. Mm-hmm. They do. Even, la- even your cheap laptops have touch screens on them. Don't touch my monitors, by the way. <laughs> I hate when people <laughs> do that. Like, oh, I'll slap your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Having an interface like this that works not only on Linux, but on Windows, maybe one day on Android, Makes a lot of sense all of a sudden when you put it through that lens of a touchscreen. Because how many times have you ever been on a touchscreen without a mouse? Like on a, if you get Linux up and working on Android, and you're like sitting there, like, eh, 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 eh. you're trying to trying to do some basic stuff. That can change with this. This is Kando. Mm-hmm. If you haven't heard about it, I wanted to give it another mention because they just hit 1.0. Look at that circle exploding. You know what? I think they got a video. Let's watch yeah. exploding circles. You click on a thing, drag it around. Hey, it does more stuff. I, I'm down with that. And you can run this on Windows, too. Which, or Mac OS. Yeah, and Mac OS, too. So that kind of gets to the point of, like, having a universal menuing system. Something that you could reliably use. Because even between, like, Android and iOS, man, completely different animals. And we definitely need something that is universal on Linux. If we ever want that fabled Linux tablet. We need something yes. that works with touch. We don't need KDE's attempt at it or GNOME's attempt at it. Why? Because they're rubbish. We need something that's just going to look at this using it. Hey, look at that. You can pull up the <laughs> tools. Done. How useful did that just become for anybody? Look how big you can make the sun. You're practically melting whatever that was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fun with the GIMP. <laughs> it is incredibly neat. And, you know, this works with, like I said, Windows, Mac OS, all your desktop, XFCE, KDE, GNOME, i3. It works with Wayland. Mm-hmm. Not only does it work with a mouse, it'll also work with a stylus. And of course, like I've said, touch. You can draw a Laura Ipsum that dragon all you want, man. <laughs> uh, Aw, Ben, doesn't this remind you of kind of the 2D version of the 3D menu system that Sun had developed? Dude, I'm just watching this ago. serial killer plague <laughs> Factorio of this thing. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was that, Joel? I'm sorry, I, I got oh, distracted by that. You got distracted. You remember, you remember the uh, 3D menu menuing system that Sun had developed. Well, this is kind of the 2D version of that, but it 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 should take off because we have touch interfaces now. <laughs> well, it makes sense in the world of touch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember um, when I first saw like uh, what was it? Canonical did Unity. Then we had like that first version. I was like, oh, I bet that works fine on touch. Then I got to play with it on touch. I'm like, nah, that's still dumb. Yeah. <laughs> so with this, and what I really yeah. want to drive home is having a cross-platform menuing system. Something, and you're like, well, I like things to be different, complex. The average person doesn't. You yeah. know, want to talk about getting somebody from one operating system to the next operating system? That's how you do it. You're like, hey, are you familiar with this here? Hey, it works like this over here. You know, as opposed to. This is how it works on this desktop. This is how it works on this desktop. This is how it works on Windows. This is how it works on Mac. There's merit to this. Yeah, there definitely is. And, you know, I actually enjoyed using the Condo Pie menu to create, you know, quick links to websites. I visit often for doing my LWW show notes. I, I set up all my, my favorite news sites. And I also used it for a quick way to mute, play, and pause my audio when playing music. Um, and YouTube videos. And um, I was happy you could change the default keyboard shortcut keys to launch the Kando Pie menu from control space to whatever you wanted in the settings menu. And I just used uh, my keyboard's insert key as my shortcut to launch the Kando Pie menu because I very rarely use it. So it's, it's very thoughtfully laid out. And there's lots, lots of things that you can change in the settings menu and then with creating new menus, it's very well done. It's extremely thought out and easy to use. Most certainly. And, you know, mm-hmm. even when you're thinking about maybe putting it through the lens of like a home theater PC with your Steam controller or something like that, radial menus, hmm, that makes sense, won't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep, that Pretty works. fun. Yeah. Good to see it. Like with everything else, uh, there'll be a link in the show notes uh, once we get the podcast up and posted. But last but not least, the natives are a little bit upset, but you know, it's probably a good thing at the end yeah. of the day, Jill. Yes. So several weeks ago, we mentioned at the Raspberry Pi 
went public with an IPO. Well, since that announcement, the Raspberry Pi company's shares went up by 32% after its IPO pricing. This is wonderful news for the Raspberry Pi company. And honestly, you know, we've, we've talked about it here on the show before. Eben Upton, the Raspberry Pi founder, has assured us that lot, a lot of the money from the IPO will go to the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And I, I just, I, I feel that's in his heart that he's actually going to be contributing, contributing that money forward to education and the hobbyists. So that's just, I, I think it's actually really good news. <laughs> So let's go ahead and dive back into reality, as I like to call it, because, <laughs> um, you know, 7.4 million SBCs, uh, they, they were sold uh, Raspberry Pis last year. 7.4 million. How many of those went to hobbyist? Not, not as many as, as before the pandemic. <laughs> Hardly any. 72% yeah. went to industrial embedded customers. Now, Evan's yeah. going to tell you, yeah, it's a necessary evil. Like, if you like money, yeah, I, I feel you, man. So uh, the company, Raspberry Pi itself, I did a little research, a little bit digging around, um, mm -hmm. had a profit last year of about $40 million. That's not too yeah. bad. Now, you, you know ARM. ARM's the reason that we have you know, Broadcom, and that's how they got the SOCs. ARM said, we're going to get $35 million a stock IPO, which is good. Do you know who else is buying into this? A name you might know, but you're like, wait, what? Sony. Sony Embedded Systems is going to be buying into that, too. Well, at the end of the day, this IPO is going to raise probably not a crazy amount of money, but at least like $200 million. And we're going to see they're going to have yeah. to restructure the Raspberry Pi Foundation and organization, how all that's laid out because of reasons when you do something like this. Okay, we'll see. There's always going to be other options. And yeah, there's no reason to like get wound up about it. It happened. Thought we'd give you the news. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for this weekly Daily Wednesdays. Thanks for joining in having some fun with us yeah. uh, come in check <laughs> it up live every wednesday 3 p.m right here on twitch.tv forward slash linux and gamecast if you want to get into our super secret discord where we're at the other six days of the week uh, you can join us by becoming a patron or use one of your bezos bucks twitch subs and just link that up come hop in we're chatting about all types of uh, linuxy things and uh car batteries like we were earlier <laughs> this morning and of course, we do the Trackmania. Jordan's going to be streaming tomorrow. And uh, I'll be back Friday, Trackmania, Linux Gamecast on Saturday. Lots of stuff to play with, lots upcoming. Keep an eye out on Interfacing Linux. If you get any questions about audio, video, multimedia production under Linux, mm -hmm. I'm there. To, that's where you can ask me. Go to the forums, ask the question. I'll give you a good answer, a real answer. Um, and we'll take care of you. Making it happen. And yeah, that's it. Patreon.com, forge last Linux Gamecast. Best way to support the show. We appreciate it. Leave your comments, thoughts, and allegations under the video. And there's that. Yeah. Let's, can we do some music now? Yes. All right. Go ahead, we'll then. <laughs> How about some credits? Happy bouncy music. We got lots of uh, wonderful patrons to appreciate, including our advisors, one in chat, uh, our Theron, our executive producers, our Chicago Kicks People, including Empty and Blasphemia, our Sea Monsters, Dirty Dean, Dick Presney, Frostclaw, our Death Notes, Turnover, Ogiwan, and Fox Dog, Swine, Piper, Oil of Hope, Jalad. Ooh, I got through that one better. <laughs> and our Chairlings. Oh my gosh. <laughs> to, <laughs> the credits go by too quickly for me to name all the lovely people. <laughs> Ladies and so gentlemen, it's been I fun. It's been a blast. <laughs> we'll see you again next week. <laughs> Love you all. Bye-bye.